What's up, guys? How is everybody doing? Uh, so excited tonight, Tuesday night, 6.30. We have gone through three chapters so far in uh, The Necessity of Prayer by E.M. Bounds, and I'm so excited to hop into this next chapter. It's going to be chapter four, Prayer and Desire. I uh, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Trihop. Uh, this is a uh, Three Rivers House of Prayer back in Longview, Washington. Um, really feel like a they're just such a powerful house. If you ever get a chance, go check them out. Go spend some time there. And uh, yeah, it's it's worth it. It's incredible. I spent uh, a couple years there and uh, I miss it. I miss it dearly. Um, but yeah, all right, well, let's start praying. Well, Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for um, Ian Bounds and the the wisdom that you gave him, the revelation that you gave him, God. And Lord, I I ask tonight that you would really show us what it is to pray and to have desire and what that looks like and how to grow those if we don't have them and and how to utilize desire in our lives. And uh, I just pray that you would have your hand upon us tonight. Holy Spirit, I give you this 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 chapter that we're reading. I give you this time and say, lead. Uh, I also want to lift up Joel Crumpton to you, Lord, as he is heading down to Atlanta right now doing homeless outreach. Uh, Father, I ask that you would use him and the team mightily tonight, that there would be many salvations, that you would draw hearts tonight, O oh God. Uh, do what only you can do, Father. I ask that you would speak through the team and use them uh, to further your kingdom, O oh God. And uh, God, I just ask that you be with us and lead us. In your name we pray. Amen. Todd, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> All right, so we are going to hop right into this. My goodness, you guys, this has been such an incredible chapter. I don't know if you read ahead and spent some time in it before we're doing our read through, but um, I've just been touched. I've, I've got a lot going on right now. I'm preparing a message for uh, Kids Revival happening this Sunday night at North Georgia Revival. I'm so excited to be a part of that. And I've uh, been, been doing this as well, finishing up my degree program with Caneo. And it's just been a lot. There's been so much coming in all the time. And so it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. But I feel like every time I sit down with this book, it, uh, it touches me in such powerful and profound ways and really challenges me and, and makes me ask some questions of myself. So... All right, let's get let's get started because we have a lot to go over. I think next week is actually a pretty short chapter, but it's going to be a good chapter as well. And so um, there will probably be less reading. We'll see how that goes. But uh, let's get started because we have a lot to do. All right. Desire is not merely a simple wish. It is a deep seated craving, an intense longing for attainment. In the realm of spiritual affairs, it is an important adjunct to prayer. So important it is that one might say almost that desire is an absolute essential of prayer. Desire precedes prayer, accompanies it, is followed by it. Desire goes before prayer and by it created and intensified. Prayer is the oral expression of desire. If prayer is asking God for something, then prayer must be expressed. Prayer comes out into the open. Desire is silent. Prayer is heard. Desire unheard. The deeper the desire, the stronger the prayer. Without desire, prayer is a meaningless mumble of words. Such perfunctory, formal praying with no heart, no feeling, no real desire accompanying it is to be shunned like a pestilence. Its exercise is a waste of precious time and from it, no real blessing accrues. My goodness, when I read that the first time, I didn't read on. And so I was like, uh, wow, like he's like saying that if I'm not having a desire that I shouldn't pray, is that is that what he's saying? Like it's just empty words that I'm speaking. And I love how he follows it up because this is so important. It's so crucial because we cannot let our feelings control if we're going to pray or not. Because if we let our feelings control our prayer lives, honestly, I think they would be dead. I do. But here we go. And yet even, 
If it be discovered that desire is honestly absent, we should pray anyway. We ought to pray. The ought comes in in order that both desire and expression be cultivated. God wor God's word commands it. Our judgment tells us we ought to pray. To pray of whether we feel like it or not, and not to allow our feelings to de determine our habits of prayer. In such circumstances, we ought to pray for the desire to pray. For such a desire is God-given and heaven-born. Isn't that the desire that you want? I don't, I don't just want a desire inside of my heart that I just kind of make happen or I'm trying to create something inside of me or, or some, like really press into something. But man, I want the God-given, heaven-born desire that only He can put in my heart. And when He puts it in my heart, I'm telling you things change. We should pray for desire then. When desire has been given... We should pray according to its dictates. So as he gives us those desires, those are the things that we need to be pressing into. Those are the things that we need to be praying about. Until that thing is fulfilled, we need to be focused in getting into that thing. Lack of spiritual desire should grieve us and lead us to lament its absence, to seek earnestly for its bestowal, so that our praying henceforth should be an expression of the soul's sincere desire. A sense of need creates or should create earnest desire. The stronger the sense of need before God, the greater should be the desire. The more earnest the praying, the poor in spirit are eminently competent to pray. Hunger is an active sense of physical need. It prompts the request for bread. In like manner, the inward consciousness of spiritual need creates desire and desire breaks forth in prayer. So as I was reading this, I mean, I got a lot of stuff. We're going to be talking about it. But the Lord spoke to me. He said, you know, it's really interesting. He said, uh, if you miss a meal, you will know it. Your body will tell you that you missed a meal. So when you fast, your body's going to show you and tell you you're missing a meal. What is happening inside of us? And do we still have that sense that we are hungering and thirsting for the Lord? Is that something that is present in our lives? And if it is not, then we really need to be checking ourselves and seeing where we are. Let me take a look here. Desire is not a feeling. Yes. No, desire is not a feeling. I agree with that. Uh, desire is something that is going to be put into us. I think that it does bring emotions, especially when it becomes some, something that is so desired and so, uh, so focused on. I think that there are emotions that can get tied to it. I mean, um, there are times when I get lost praying for somebody and my emotions get the better of me because I want to see this person come to the Lord. And Father, I'm crying out to you because of this desire that you put in my heart. And so I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's a feeling. Desire is something that, that you will feel, well, not feel, but you will know and you will press into. And so you need to continue pressing into even when you don't feel it. Does that make sense? I hope so. I don't know how long the delay is on live, so I'm still new at this. And I will try to answer questions as they come, um, and we'll see how that goes. All right. So, uh, just to recap, hunger and fasting, you miss a meal one day, and you will understand the physical prompting that comes from the flesh. So must it be with the spirit man inside of us. Desire is an inward longing for something of which, uh, which we are, <clears throat> of which we are not possessed, of which we stand in need, something which God has promised and which may be secured by an earnest supplication of his throne of grace. Spiritual desire carried to a higher degree is the evidence of the new birth. It is born in the renewed soul as a newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby the absence of this holy desire in the hearts in the heart is presumptive proof either of a decline in spiritual ecstasy or the new birth has never taken place 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. My goodness, as I was reading through this part, like the Lord touched me so much. And like, I had read this so many times, so many times. But understanding when, when we have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God, understand that we are going to be filled. He is going to come and he is going to meet us as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, as we hunger and thirst and press into these things. God is going to come and that he is going to fill us. He is going to fill us. I love it when he has proclamations like this. For they shall be filled. These heart-given appetites are the proof of a renewed heart, the evidence of a stirring spiritual life. Physical appetites are the attributes of a living body, not a corpse. And spiritual desires belong to a soul made alive, made alive to God. Just as the physical body has appetite, so spiritual desire belong to a soul made alive to God. And as the renewed soul hungers and thirsts after righteousness, these holy inward desires break out in earnest supplication, prayer. I don't know about you, but I've been touched so many times by the Lord with these desires that, 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 that rise up inside of me. And uh, it, it's so true. These holy inward desires break out. As I'm praying, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll be walking in the, in, the, in the church sanctuary and I'm, I'm just praying in tongues and then the Lord will break out. He'll just break out with something. And I've got such a focus and I've got such a desire for this thing to see the, the church either set on fire or the, chi the church stirred or, or things that are coming that I just press into those things and I have to see him move and I have to see it happen. In prayer, we are shut up to the name, merit, and intercessory virtue of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, probing down below the accompanying conditions and forces in prayer. We come to, to its vital basis, which is seated to the human heart or in the human heart. It is not simply our need. It is the heart's yearning for what we need and for which we feel impelled to pray. Desire is the will in action, a strong, conscious longing, excited in the inner nature for some great good. Desire exalts the object of its longing and fixes the mind on it. It has choice and fixedness and flame in it. And prayer, based thereon, is explicit and specific. It knows its need, feels and sees the things, the thing that will meet it, and hastens to acquire it. Holy desire is much helped by devout contemplation. Meditation on spiritual need and on God's readiness and ability to correct it aids desire to grow. Serious thought engaged in before praying increases desire, makes it more ability to, or makes it more insistent and tends to save us from the menace of private prayer, wandering thought. We fail much more in desire than in its outward expression. We retain the form while the inner life fades and almost dies. So interesting. I, I believe I touched on this in the first um, uh, week, the first chapter. But when I am coming before the Lord to pray, I'm going to actually meditate on something. I'm going to really get my heart posture correct before I press into that thing. So I'm not just... Um, having my mind wander, but I really want to be very specific when I pray to the Lord. And so um, take some time. It may be this uncomfortable silence that you press into, and that's okay. But can I tell you something? Everybody that I've done this with, um, they're like, you know, something that really separates you is that you actually take time before the Lord and I know that you're seeking his face before the prayers come out. And so let us not be quick to speak, but let us take a minute. When somebody asks you to pray or, or you're going to be leading a prayer, take a minute. It's okay to have some silence. Even if it's uncomfortable for the rest of the people, because who you're speaking to is so much more important 
the words coming out of your mouth. So I would just encourage you in that. One might well ask whether the feebleness of our desires for God, the Holy Spirit, and for all the fullness of Christ is not the cause of our so little praying and our languishing in the exercise of prayer. Do we really feel these inward pantings of desire after heavenly treasures? Do the inbred groanings of desire stir our soul's mighty wrestlings? Alas for us, the fire burns altogether too low. The flaming heat of soul has been tempered down to a tepid lukewarmness. This, it should be remembered, was the central cause of the sad and desperate condition of the Laodicean Christians, of whom the awful condemnation is written, that they were rich and increased in goods and had need of nothing, and knew not that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind. We as the church in America have to be so careful about this, guys. Because honestly, we, most of us have no need. We have wants, but there's a difference between a want and a need. And so many times we can get caught up in the wants or the desire of of wants and we can miss it. But we have to realize that we need God. We need to find a way that we can pray to him and come before him in a way that he can move every day in our lives. What is the need? And, and to be honest, as Americans, the biggest need is to see him show up in my, in my heart. Like he can provide anything that he wants to provide physically in my, in my family and in my life. But if he does not show up, what's the point? And I love how he shows up. Today I turned on some worship music while I was studying and just got caught up in the Lord. Sometimes we need to just take a minute, turn on some worship music, and just get lost in Him. And maybe that's five, ten minutes. I mean, I've just sat here bawling. (laughs) It was such a sweet time with the Lord. It was so good. But, yeah. Sidetrack. All right. Again, we might well inquire, have we that desire which presses us to close communion with God, which is filled with un utterable burnings and holds us there through the agony of an intense and soul-stirred supplication. Our hearts need much to be worked over, not only to get the evil out of them, but to get the good in them. And the foundation and inspiration of the incoming good is strong, propelling desire. The holy and fervid flame in the soul awakens the interests of heaven attracts the attention of God, and places at the disposal of those who exercise it the exhaustless riches of divine grace. I'm going to read that one more time because that is so good. This holy and fervid flame in the soul awakens the interest of heaven, attracts the attention of God, and places at the disposal of those who exercise it the exhaustless riches of divine grace. Oh, Lord. Let us have, let us be holy and have just this fervent flame about us, God. The dampening of the flame of holy desire is destructive of of the vital and aggressive forces in church life. God requires to be represented by a fiery church or he is not in any proper sense represented at all. This like slap me in the face. God requires to be represented by a fiery church, or he is not in any proper sense represented at all. So if we're just throwing religious ideas and religious thoughts and religious things at people, God is not being represented. It is when we are walking in the fire of the Lord that he is being represented by us. Whew, that's good. That's good. God himself is all on fire, and his church, if it is to be like him, must also be at white heat. Not orange heat, not blue heat, white heat. The great and eternal interests of heaven-born, God-given religion are the only things about which his church can afford to be on fire. Yet holy zeal, not to be fussy in order to be consuming— 
or not to be fussy in order to be clamorous de uh, declamation, yet the zeal of God's house consumed him. Uh, I messed up. In order to be consuming, our Lord was the incarnate antithesis of nervous excitability and absolute opposite of intolerant or clamorous declamation. Yet the zeal of God's house consumed him, and the world is still feeling the glow of his fierce consuming flame and responding to it with an ever-increasing readiness and an ever-enlarging response. I got to just throw this in here because this is so, so, uh, so great. So uh, we all know that the, the uh, well, we don't all know this, but if you didn't know this, the gate beautiful was the entrance to the temple and it was at the Gentile court. And did you know that John and Peter actually healed a lame man at the gate beautiful? Right after Jesus goes out and he cleanses the temple, which is this zeal for his house, right? This zeal for his house. After he goes and he cleanses the temple, he goes and he gets crucified. Pentecost happens. And then right after Pentecost happens, Paul and, or not Paul, Paul comes later. Peter and John go to the temple and they heal a lame man. Now, you need to understand that Jesus has just cleansed the temple, right? He just cleansed the temple. Then he gets crucified. And then after he gets crucified, his two apostles then go to the temple. And as they go to the temple, they heal a lame man and bring this man inside the temple. And what do they say? It was because of Jesus. So these Pharisees and Sadducees must have been losing their minds because of the fact that Jesus had just come and cleansed the temple. They're losing their minds because this guy is going cr crazy on them. And then his apostles come and heal a lame man in his name. And they, this guy has been lame since birth. What do you think is going through these guys' head? Like, they just can't win. There's just nothing that they can do to get ahead. So I just thought that was cool. I, I was reading through that and I was like, the gate beautiful. Oh my goodness, I, we just saw that in Tabernacle. Oh my goodness, that's the Gentile court. Jesus had been there. That's, where, that's right where Jesus cleansed it. This is incredible. So I just thought I'd add that in. You know, just a little side note. It's so good, so good. Uh, okay, now I got to find myself because I lost myself. Okay. <laughs> yes. And the world is still feeling the glow of his fierce, consuming flame and responding to it with an ever-increasing readiness and an ever-enlarging response. A lack of ardor and prayer. Ardor is passion. So a lack of passion and prayer is the sure sign of a lack of depth and intensity of desire. And the absence of intense desire is a sure sign of God's absence from the heart. My question for you is, where are you at right now? Do you have a passionate prayer life? Are you lukewarm? Are you cold? Are you hot? Do you feel like the Lord is pressing into you? To abate fervor means to lessen. To lessen passion is to retire from God. He can and does tolerate many things in the way of infirmity and error in his children. He can and will pardon sin when the penitent prays, but two things are intolerable to him, insinc insincerity and lukewarmness. Lack of heart and lack of feet are two things he loathes. And to the Laodiceans, he said, in terms of in unmistakable severity and condemnation, I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Again, we have to be so careful, guys, because we have everything at our fingertips. And sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the fact that we have all that we, not, all that we need, all that we want, and we can provide it with our own hands. But then we forget about our breath. Then we forget about the rain. We forget about other things that the Lord does in our lives, the protection, his angels, the way he watches over us. So don't get lost and don't get stuck 
because it's so easy in this culture right now to have one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus. And we cannot play this, this central, this center game where we play both roles. We can't do it. We can't do it. He says he will spew us out. It will be just as like when he says in Matthew that he never knew us. We have to be devoted to him. So my hope is and my prayer is that you will not straddle the fence, but you will press in to him. This was God's express judgment on the lack of fire in one of the seven churches. And it is his indictment against individual Christians for the fatal want of sacred zeal. In prayer, fire is the motive power. Religious principles which do not emerge in flame have neither force nor effect. Flame is the wing on which faith ascends. Remember what we talked about a few weeks ago, faith, the importance of faith. Flame, your fire, is the wing on which faith ascends. Fervency is the soul of prayer. It was the fervent, effectual prayer which availed much. Love is kindled in a flame, and ardency is its life. Flame is the air which true Christian experience breathes. I'm going to read that again. Flame is the air which true Christian experience breathes. It feeds on fire. It can withstand anything rather than a a feeble flame, and it dies, chilled and starved to its vitals when the surrounding atmosphere is frigid or lukewarm. Guys, we have got to be people that can withstand the frigid temperatures that are around us because it is cold out there. We have got to be red hot. We've got to be red hot, especially in our prayer lives and our times with the Lord. True prayer must be aflame. Christian life and character needs to be all on fire. Lack of spiritual heat creates more infidelity than lack of faith. Lack of spiritual heat creates more infidelity than lack of faith. I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. The moments where I fall is when I have lost my spiritual heat, when I've lost my fire, when I've gone cold, when I've drifted, when my flame has slowly been put out. That's when my infidelity happens. Not to be consumingly interested about the things of heaven is not to be interested in them at all. The fiery souls are those who conquer in the day of battle, from whom the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and who take it by force. The citadel of God is taken only by those who storm it in dreadful earnestness, who besiege it with fiery, unabated zeal. Nothing short of being red hot for God can keep the glow of heaven in our hearts these chilly days. I love this. This is so good. Talking about faith right here. Just watch. Just watch. The early Methodists had no heating apparatus in their churches. That means that they had nothing to heat the building. They declared that the flame in the pew and the fire in the pulpit must suffice to keep them warm. And we of this hour have need to have the live coal from God's altar and the consuming flame from heaven glowing in our hearts. This flame is not mental vehemency nor fleshly energy. It is divine fire in the soul, intense, dross-consuming, the very essence of the Spirit of God. So powerful. It is not by our mental power or or fierceness. It is not by our, our fleshly energy. It is the divine fire in the soul, intense, dross-consuming. That means that it is burning away impurities, the very essence of the Spirit of God. No, I don't even know how to say this word, erudition, it's uh, scholarliness. No purity of diction, no width of mental outlook, no flowers of eloquence, no grace of person can atone for lack of fire. It doesn't matter how skilled you are at talking. It doesn't matter if you have a silver tongue. You could, have, you could know all things, but if you don't have the fire of the Lord inside of you, there's nothing that can change that. Nothing that can change that. You can't fake it. 
You can't make it. Only the Lord can put that inside of you. Prayer ascends by fire. Flame gives prayer access as well as wings, acceptance as well as energy. There is no incense without fire. My Kaneo people, there's no incense without fire. We have to be on fire. My goodness, this was so good when I read it. No prayer without flame. We got to be burning the incense. We've got to be burning the incense. Is your prayer life on fire enough to where you're burning the incense? Or are you just throwing stuff on? Ardent desire is the basis of unceasing prayer. It is not shallow, fickle. It is not a shallow, fickle inclination, but a strong yearning, an unquenchable ardor, which impregnates, glows, burns, and fixes the heart. It is the flame of a present and active principle mounting up to God. It is ardor propelled by desire that burns its way to the throne of mercy and gains its plea. It is the pertinacity. Pertinacity is a quality of sticking with something no matter what. It is the pertinacity of desire that gives triumph to the conflict in a great struggle of prayer. It is the burden of a weighty desire that sobers, makes restless, and reduces to quietness the soul just emerged from its mighty wrestlings. It is the embracing character of desire which arms prayer with a thousand pleas and robes it with an invincible courage and an all-conquering power. The Syrophoenician woman is an object lesson of desire, settled to its consistency but invulnerable in its intensity and pertinacious boldness. The importunate widow, the persistent widow, represents desire gaining its end through obstacles insuperable or insuperable to feeble, feebler impulses. Prayer is not the rehearsal of a mere performance, nor is it an indefinite widespread clamor. Desire, while it kindles the soul, holds it to the object sought. Prayer is an indispensable phase of spiritual habit, but it ceases to be prayer when carried on by habit alone. Did you guys catch that? Prayer is an indispensable phase of spiritual habit, but it ceases to be prayer when carried on by habit alone. Be careful about this. Be careful about this. It is depth and intensity of spiritual desire which gives intensity and depth to prayer. The soul cannot be listless when some great desire fires and inflames it. The urgency of our desire holds us to the thing desired with a tenacity which refuses to be lessened or loosened. It stays and pleads and persists and refuses to let go until the blessings has been vouchsafed. Lord, I cannot let thee go till the blessing thou bestow. Do not turn away thy face. Mine's an urgent, pressing case. The secret of faint-heartedness, lack of importunity, want of courage and strength in prayer lies in the weakness of spiritual desire. While the non-observance of prayer is the fearful token of the desire having ceased to live, that soul has turned from God whose desire after him no longer presses to the... It, to the inner chamber. That soul has turned from God whose desire after him no longer presses it to the inner chamber. There can be no successful praying without consuming desire. Of course, there can be much seeming to pray without desire of any kind. Many things may be cataloged and much ground covered, but does desire compile the catalog? Does desire map out the region to be covered? On the answer hangs the issue of whether our petitioning be prating or prayer. Prating is what uh, Jesus is talking about with the long-winded prayers who pray on the street corners with these elaborate prayers that just go on and go on and go on. He says they've received their reward. I'll, I'll read that again. On the answer hangs the issue of whether our petitioning be prating or prayer. Desire is intense, but narrow. It cannot spread itself over a wide area. It wants a few things and wants them badly. 
so badly that nothing but God's willingness to answer can bring it easement or content. When was the last time you had something that the Lord placed on your, your heart so strongly that you came before him every single day and you were like, I am not going to stop until you come through. I am not going to slow down. I am not going to give up. I am not going to let up because you have told me and you have put this desire in my heart. And so I am going to press through and I'm going to press in until I see this thing come to fruition. If he has a desire in your heart that you've given up on, I, I, just, I just want to speak life to that thing again and ask that she would press into it. The Lord put that desire in your heart for a reason. Press into that thing. Don't give up. Don't let up. He will show himself and he will bring it to fruition. Desire single shots at its objective. I love that. Desire is so focused. It's so focused. There may be many things desired, but they are specifically and individually felt and expressed. It's, it's so interesting. Like I was talking to a, a, a guy today and he was talking about um, just prayer. And he's like, Austin, how do I, how do I pray um, for this group of people? These, and you know, as I read this, there may be many things desired. You know, as he's praying for this group of guys that he wants to see come to the Lord, there's, there's focuses within each one of them. There's a desire for each person. It's not like he's just looking at this group and he's trying to blanket them, but, but he's trying to literally have God draw each one of them. So he knows them each by name, but he has many desires. Now, this desire is focused because he's praying over his team, but he's also praying individually for each person. Just like the Lord is going to give you bigger things that you're going to pray for, but he's also going to give you desires for very, very specific things within those things, if that makes sense. David did not yearn for everything nor did he allow his desire to spread out everywhere and hit nothing. Here is the way his desires ran and found expression. I love this. Oh, Lord, let this be my heart. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then I thought the chapter was over, but we get to keep going. Let's go. It is the singleness of desire, the definiteness of yearning, which counts in praying and which drives prayer directly to core and center of supply. In the Beatitudes, Jesus voiced the words which directly bear upon the innate desires of a renewed soul and the promise that they will be granted. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This then is the basis of prayer which compels an answer. The strong inward desire has entered into spiritual appetite and clamors to be satisfied. Alas for us, it is altogether too true and frequent that our prayers operate in the arid region of a mere wish or in the leafless area of a memorized prayer. Sometimes, indeed, our prayers are merely stereotyped expressions of set phrases and, and conventional proportions and freshness in life of which have departed long years ago. Without desire, there is no burden of soul, no sense of need, no ardency, no vision, no strength, no glow of faith. I'm going to read this again. If any of these hit you, you need to ask the Lord to really come and to touch your heart and to give you desire. You need to be praying for desire. Lord, give me desire to pray. Without desire, there is no burden of soul, no sense of need, no ardency, no vision, no strength, no glow of faith. 
There is no mighty pressure, no holding on to God with a deathless, despairing grasp. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. There is no utter self-abandonment as there was with Moses when lost in the throes of a desperate, pertinacious, and all-consuming plea, he cried, Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. Or as there was with John Knox when he pleaded, Give me Scotland or I die. God draws mightily near to the praying soul to see God, to know God, and to live for God. These form the objectives of all true praying. To see God, to know God, and to live for God. These form the objective of all true praying. Thus praying is, after all, inspired to seek after God. Prayer desired is inflamed to see God, to have clearer, fuller, sweeter, and richer revelation of God. So to those who thus pray, the Bible becomes a new Bible and Christ a new Savior by the light and revelation of the inner chamber. I know we're getting close I've got one more paragraph left, but I'm telling you guys, if the Bible is not coming alive to you, you need to be reading it every single day. You should be reading it every day anyway, but if the Bible is not coming alive to you, you need to, every time you open up that word, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would reveal your word to me. Every time I open up my Bible, there is revelation that comes. Every time I open up my Bible, there is something that I want to put on my heart so that I can share with others. Every time I open my Bible, I get to see a little bit more of Jesus. I get to see a little bit more of God. There should be something that's happening inside of you every time you read your word. And if it's not, I would, I would plead with you. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to show you. Ask him to speak to you. So to those who thus pray, the Bible becomes a new Bible. So true, guys. There are so many people who have read the Bible just to read the Bible. They know the words, but they don't know the Savior. When we know the Savior, when we pray to the Savior, when we we know the Savior's voice and and we can feel and sense the Savior, not that it's all about feeling, but there are moments where He's going to grab your heart on something. The Bible comes alive. It's like it's got fire on the words in a way that only He can do. So to those who thus pray, the Bible becomes a new Bible and Christ a new Savior by the light and revelation of the inner chamber. The inner chamber. We've got to be there. We have got to seek after the inner chamber. We iterate and reiterate that burning desire, enlarged and even enlarging for the best and most powerful gifts and graces of the Spirit of God, is the legitimate heritage of true and effectual praying. Self and service cannot be divorced, cannot possibly be separated. More than that, desire must be made intensely personal, must be centered on God with an insatiable hungering and thirsting after him and his righteousness. My soul thirsteth for God, the living God. The indispensable requisite for all true praying is a deeply seated desire which seeks after God himself and remains unappeased until the choicest gift in heaven bes- heaven's bestowal have been richly and abundantly vouchsafed. Father, I thank you for this chapter on desire. Father, I ask that you would put a desire in each one of our hearts, Lord, I ask for a hunger and a thirst to rise up inside of us, God. Even if we're hungry, even if we're thirsty, I pray that our spiritual hunger and thirst would would increase, O God. I ask that we would be red hot. 
Teach us what it is to desire God. Teach us what it is to pray for those things that that we desire for, that you have implanted in our hearts, that you've, you've put before us, that you've given us desire for. God, teach us what it is to pray and to really press into those things. Give us a tenacity to do it every day. Give us Give us grace to really press into this, oh God. I'm asking that we would be Christians that are on fire in everything that we do. That we would never settle. We wouldn't be cold. We wouldn't be complacent. But God, that we would press in and we would press through. God, cause desire to rise up. Cause faith to rise up. Give us more trust. Lead us and guide us, O God. Teach us to pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I am so excited about this next chapter on fervency. I am, I don't know, this, this last, this, this chapter on desire, I'm telling you, it just hit me in so many ways. Like, we've got to be on fire for the Lord. We've got to continue having de- a, a desire for Him. We cannot just settle. We cannot just show up on Sundays. We cannot just just do things to do things. We can't let the habits take over. We've got to stay focused, and we've got to to continue to have this fervency, this this desire, and this prayer for the Lord. So I would encourage you just to take, take a check. How am I doing spiritually? How is my walk with God? And remember, it's not about feelings. It's not about feelings. I believe that the Lord will touch you in certain times and that there will be times where his peace is going to come and, and his joy and, and the revelation of the Lord and you're going you're gonna to feel the goosebumps of the Lord. But, but don't let those things control you. Remember what he says in the very beginning. And not to allow our feelings to determine our habits of prayer. We've got to be consistent. We've got to be persistent. Press into those desires. And don't forget to ask every day, three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Increase my faith, O God. I'm telling you, watch and see what he does. All right. That's all I got. All right. Love you guys. I will see you next week. Any comments or anything, let me know, ideas, thoughts, things you would like to see or hear more about or questions you may have, um, leave them down below and uh, I'll get back to you. All right. Love y'all.